Okay, well, as you've seen from the talk so far, we clearly completely understand life on Earth. So our next question is, where might we find life beyond our planet? So this, our sun is one of 100 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy. And when we talk about extrasolar planets, we're saying extra as in outside, and solar means the sun. So an extrasolar planet or exoplanet is a planet that orbits a star that is not our sun. And in the last 20 or 25 years, we have discovered over three and a half thousand exoplanets. Roughly one third of those have a radius that is less than twice the size of the Earth. So we have all these Earth-sized worlds, but could any of them be inhabited? And how would we know? Well, 90, 98, 96, 96% of exoplanets have been discovered through one of two techniques. The first of these is known as the radial velocity technique, or Doppler wobble. And here, the planet's gravity causes the star to make a very small movement, a tiny wobble that pushes it towards and away from the Earth. And as it moves towards and away from us, its light gets stretched and compressed. And stretching and compressing these wavelengths turn it from slightly redder to slightly bluer. And if we can measure that, we get a sense of the mass of the planet that might be orbiting it. The second technique is called the transit method. And here, the planet passes between the star and where we're viewing on Earth. And as it passes across the star's surface, a tiny bit of the light is obscured to indicate a planet might be there. Now, typically, this tells us two pieces of information about the planet. The first is something about its physical size. If the planet has been found through the transit technique, the amount of light it obscures tells us about the planet's radius. Alternatively, if the planet is found through the Doppler wobble technique, the size of the wobble that it induces in a star tells us about the planet's minimum mass. The second thing we typically know is how much starlight, so how much radiation, is reaching the planet from its star. Now, this is not the same as knowing the temperature on the planet's surface. Indeed, in our own solar system, Venus receives roughly twice the amount of sunlight compared to the Earth. And if you were to guess at Venus's surface temperature based on this number, you might think Venus had a surface temperature of hmm, 27, 30 degrees. Sounds quite nice. Maybe go there for a holiday. In fact, the surface temperature of Venus is 460 Celsius. It melts lead. And the longest a spacecraft has ever survived on the Venetian surface is less than two hours. So these two properties don't tell us anything about the surface conditions. And it's the surface conditions we're really interested in when we want to think about life. So what does it take to be an Earth? Well, size is certainly part of it. If the planet is vastly bigger than the Earth, the chances are it will be like Jupiter, with a colossal atmosphere and no real surface that anything could live upon. However, as we've heard from Marine, there's also our planet's magnetic field that protects us from the worst of the sun's flares and radiation. We see this as a northern lights. Occasionally, a strong flare may damage our GPS systems, but it doesn't sterilize our surface because we have this protective magnetic field. We also have volcanoes, which don't initially seem like a good thing, but in fact help generate our atmosphere that we breathe. Our rock type helps also regulate the amount of greenhouse gases in our air. And the presence of water. As we've heard, our planet was probably born dry and later had a delivery of icy meteorites that gave us our oceans. So you could have a planet that was very similar to the Earth, but without the presence of a giant planet like Jupiter to start shoveling in these icy meteorites, we might not have ever had a water delivery service. 
And plate tectonics, the fact our crust is broken up into bite-sized chunks, helps with cooling and helps generate our magnetic field. So it takes a lot to be an Earth. And we don't know very much about exoplanets yet. Our newest missions are aimed at finding out a little bit more. The aim is to start looking at light that has passed through the planet's atmosphere. And as starlight passes through a planet's atmosphere, certain wavelengths are absorbed by the molecules in the atmosphere. So if those are missing when we see the starlight, that gives us a hint of what the gases are in the planet's air, and therefore what might be going on on the planet's surface. So we have a fingerprint to identify gases in terms of missing wavelengths that have been absorbed by the planet's atmosphere. So we end up with something like this, where the dips correspond to certain elements in the air. So, can this identify life? Well, one way to test would be to look at a planet we know has life and see if these gases can confirm that. Well, there's only one planet we know that has life, that's this one. And fortunately, we got the chance to observe it in 1989. NASA's Galileo spacecraft was on its way to Jupiter, but en route it swung by the Earth and took a look at our planet with its instruments. So Galileo viewed the Earth from just a thousand kilometers away. So if it couldn't find detectable life, we're in trouble. So what did Galileo see? Well, in particular, Galileo saw three things. It saw the presence of water, it saw the presence of oxygen, and it saw the presence of methane. So are these enough to definitely say life? Because they're all related to life on the Earth. Well, the paper that published this result in Nature was led by Carl Sagan, a famous science communicator. And he concluded it was strongly suggestive of life, but he wasn't prepared to say it was definite. So why not? Well, what we're hunting for is a biosignature, a signature of biological activity. Let's take a look at each of the things Galileo saw. Water. On Earth, life is found wherever there is water. And this includes some deeply unlikely places. For example, in deep sea hydrothermal vents that exist on the ocean floor, there is no light that reaches this place. Sunlight cannot penetrate that deep. The temperature around these vents can be 400 Celsius, and there is crushing pressures from the ocean. And yet, we can find a thriving ecosystem here. The same is true at the opposite end of the extreme with glaciers of frozen water, and even places like the acidic lakes found in Yellowstone National Park. All of these are found to contain life. So regardless of the other conditions, it seems that water gives you life on Earth. And the reason for this is that water is a great solvent. So if we look at the cells for life, we can see that water can deliver nutrients and it can flush away toxic waste that might kill a cell. It's also great at chemistry for biological systems, allowing us to build large complex molecules that life needs. But water alone it does not prove life. It's great for life, but it's not proof life is there. For example, in our own solar system, the Jovian moon of Ganymede is thought to have deep oceans underneath its icy crust, but it's not thought to be habitable. Okay, so how about oxygen? Well, on Earth, oxygen is primarily produced by photosynthesis. That is, plants are using sunlight for energy and they're producing oxygen as a byproduct. Now, starlight is going to be a major energy source for most planets that we know of. So it's not unreasonable to assume that life on other planets may also use photosynthesis and generate oxygen as the same byproduct. But it's not the only way oxygen can be produced. In particular, ultraviolet light from the star can break apart water molecules into oxygen and hydrogen. 
Now, a planet with the mass of roughly the Earth can't hold on to a gas that is as light as hydrogen. So in this case, the hydrogen escapes and you get left with an oxygen atmosphere without life. And again, we have an example in our own solar system. The Jovian moons have tenuous oxygen atmospheres and that's because the UV is breaking apart the ice with water, water molecules on the surface. The hydrogen is escaping and you're left with the oxygen, but definitely no trees. So what about methane? Well, on Earth, methane is typically found due to microbes in the guts of animals, and it's also produced by decomposing plants. But <laughs> again, in our solar system, we have a counterexample. So Saturn's moon Titan has a methane atmosphere. It's roughly 5% methane. And that's produced because underneath Titan's surface, there's thought to be a methane sea, which gets ejected to the surface through volcanoes. So we have a methane atmosphere, but uh, no cows, no cows. So our best bet may be a combination of these markers. For example, if we had oxygen and methane, maybe that would be indication of life. So if left alone and not replenished, oxygen plus methane forms carbon dioxide. So therefore, if we see methane and oxygen, and it hasn't formed, it hasn't all formed carbon dioxide, that suggests something is continuously producing it. But <laughs> you could imagine a system where you might have, say, a planet with this tenuous oxygen atmosphere produced by light, and maybe a moon with a methane atmosphere, and the signatures might overlap. So we would think we were seeing one body with both oxygen and methane, but actually there were two that were very close together. So the bottom line is, when we start looking for alien life, we're going to have to be very cautious. And as Carl Sagan said, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. So I think our next generation of telescopes will find evidence that could be life but we should expect to spend many decades arguing over whether it actually is. But assuming we find this biosignature, where might we find life that wasn't Earth? Well, according to Earth, the life recipe requires three things. It requires water for our, bio our biological reactions to build up our complex molecules. It requires biogenic elements, so the elements of life, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, for living systems. And it requires an energy source, something to power life's metabolisms. So where might we find environments that are different from ours, but might still have these key ingredients? Well, one exciting possibility is actually Europa, one of the moons of Jupiter. And this does have, we suspect, we know, a strong, a large subsurface ocean. Now, by definition, big ocean, water, check, no problem. What about our biological elements? Well, we think Europa probably could have them. Meteorites, uh, which come from comets and asteroids, can definitely form the beginnings of organic molecules. And we think these arrived on Earth, we know Europa is pockmarked from collisions with these bodies. So if they could go through the ice, we would expect the ocean to be infused with these organic ingredients. So, okay, let's give it a tick. How about energy? Well, Jupiter's an awfully a long way away from the sun. It's not going to be receiving much sunlight. However, it turns out to have an alternative energy source. Europa's orbit is slightly elliptical due to the pull from neighboring moons Io and Ganymede. And this means that it comes closer to Jupiter and then it moves a bit further away. And as it does, Jupiter's gravity strengthens and weakens. And this means the moon is actually flexed like squeezing a uh, stress ball. And as this flexing occurs, the moon is heated and we call this tidal heating. 
So tick, Europa may indeed have all three key ingredients. So how do we find out? Well, Europa is in our solar system, so let's go. And there's two future missions that are going to be exploring this. The first is JUICE, Jupiter Icy Moon Explorer mission. This is a mission led by the European Space Agency, but it has a strong association with Japan's JAXA as well. And JUICE will launch in 2022 and arrive in 2030, and it's going to be exploring a number of the moons, principally Ganymede, but also Europa. Following that is going to be NASA's Europa Clipper, which is hoping to launch sometime in the 2020s if the mission is finally approved. And this will be a mission focused on Europa with plans to see if there's any detectable signs of life. However, this is all very well when we can go to the place. But if we're going to start looking at exoplanets, subsurface life is going to be really hard to spot. We need life that can interact with the planet's atmosphere. So what about detectable life on exoplanets? Well, Gliese 1214b is interesting because its density is weird. It has a density that's too low to be a rocky planet like the Earth, but too high for gas. So what is it? Well, we think it may be a water world with a global ocean covering the whole planet. Could that be habitable? It's got water, but for a surface ocean, we have some problems, namely our atmosphere. So on Earth, carbon dioxide keeps our Earth warm, and the quantity is controlled by something called the carbon cycle. So here, the carbon dioxide in the air comes down as rain, it reacts with the rocks and forms a solid. The solid get washed into the ocean, and then eventually it's returned to the atmosphere through volcanoes. Now, during the early stages of our Earth's life, the sun was cooler and dimmer, and this actually would have reduced the reaction with the rock. And so we would have ended up pumping more carbon dioxide into the air than we were taking out. And this would allow our planet to stay warm during these early cooler years when life was beginning to start. If we don't have a carbon cycle, because carbon cycles need land, you have to get exactly the right amount of radiation hitting the planet, which becomes a lot less likely and means the planet is not resilient to slight changes in the amount of radiation it's receiving. So we're unsure whether a water world could indeed be habitable. Another planet that's hit the news a lot are the TRAPPIST system. These came to light in February this year, and everyone got very excited. So TRAPPIST-1e is a planet that orbits its star in just six days. But its star is very, very dim. So TRAPPIST-1e actually receives a very similar amount of radiation as the Earth does from the Sun. However, it is so close to the star that we expect one side of the planet to be facing the star at all times in the same way the moon always is pointing to the Earth. And the reason for this is that at such close proximity, a bulge is raised due to the gravity of the star on the planet. And as the planet tries to rotate, the star's gravity drags on this bulge and causes the planet to turn so that one side is always facing the star. And we call this tidal locking. And what this means is the planet is a split world, one side of perpetual day that can get very hot, and one side of icy night that is always facing away from the star. Now, if the planet's atmosphere is thick enough, you could have winds that redistributed that heat. And in which case, it might be possible to have this twilight zone between the cold side and the hot side, where liquid water could form and the star was always on the horizon. So the bottom line is yet, we don't quite know what it takes to be a habitable planet, because we only have one example. But with future missions and our new telescopes, we're on the brink of finding out a lot more. Thank you.